Our next speaker uh, is Sarah Light, our area agronomy advisor, and she'll be giving a pest management update on field crops. Thanks, Amber. So I'm going to be talking about um, some recent research in the Sacramento Valley on field crops. Some of this is research that I've worked on. Some is a work that Rachel Long has done. She's down in the Capital Corridor area, uh, Yolo, Sacramento, um, Solano County, and some is work that we've worked on together. You can see my email here, so please feel free to follow up with me with any questions. A quick reminder of resources, our Agronomy Resource Research and Information Center, AGRIC, has um, quite extensive resources on uh, field crop research and uh, information from UC researchers throughout the state. It's kind of our centralized hub. So please visit that first. You can also find points of contact for specific crops if you have questions, et cetera. Our UCIPM page here also has crop specific information. Um, this is my website that you can find through our CE Sutter Yuba, Sutter Yuba office and you can subscribe to my newsletter there. And then we have quite a lot of ANR specific blogs around uh, for specific crops um, and other topics that we keep really up to date. And sometimes that's the fastest way to get um, updates about pests that we've seen in the field. So uh, be sure to subscribe if you want to follow what's going on. Okay, so the first project I'm going to talk about is evaluating the efficacy of a preplant weed control in alfalfa. So in this trial, uh, there were basically, it was a, a split plot design. So pre-plant, there was either no treatment applied, tillage, or glyphosate. Um, and then in season, there was either no treatment or a raptor spray. And so we had the combination of both the pre-plant and in season for both. This is a plot with glyphosate applied pre-plant plus in season raptor. A uh, nice looking alfalfa stand um, here on the left where you see this kind of dry uh, gray strip. Um, that is one of the plots that had neither um, pre-plant or in season. And so it was very, very heavy in weeds. And then in the kind of foreground, um, you can see uh, again, a higher canopy. And that is uh, where the raptor was not implied in season. This is a close up of that plot. So this is glyphosate pre-plant, but no in-season herbicide. I also um, call this plot the, the area where you would hide your farm advisor body after they convince you to work on a project that results in a weedy alfalfa stand. So it was very, very tall weeds above my head. Uh, I took weed stand counts at different points throughout the growing season, but I'm just going to show this one date. Uh, the full report will be available on my website. So if you're interested in how the dynamics changed throughout the season, you can review that for more information. Um, so the top table is the percent cover of broad leaves at last weed count. So basically for this, I took out a quadrant that was a meter by meter and put it in a representative part of the field three times and then evaluated the percent cover of broad leaves, alfalfa, grasses, as well as bare soil. And for the treatments that had, uh, that had pre-plant treatments, um, so that's here on the left, and then the raptor in season or no is on the right. And so the ones that had no pre-plant treatment really had quite heavy broadleaf weed pressure, both uh, with and without the raptor control. Um, the glyphosate pre-plant and tillage pre-plant combined with the raptor resulted in very low percentage of broadleaves. Um, but when the glyphosate and the tillage were applied, um, pre-plant, but there was no in-season control, there was still a significant reduction in, in percent broad leaves as compared to uh, the no control plots. Uh, kind of the converse of that, the flip side is if you go and look at the bottom table, this is the percent cover between treatments at last weed count. Um, and it's sort of the reverse where there's more alfalfa here in the plots where the weeds were very effectively controlled by pre-plant and in-season application and the alfalfa was less percent of the of the cover when there was no in-season control. Uh, this is some yield data. And so uh, the plots were harvested with these meter by meter quadrants. And then the biomass was separated into alfalfa and weeds and those were dried and weighed separately. Um, so there were um, significantly more weeds, this data is not shown by weight in the side of the field that did not get the herbicide spray in season compared to the side that did. In other words, where there was no raptor control, there was 
um, more, there were more weeds. However, within the, the side of the field where the raptor was sprayed or not, uh, there were actually not significant differences by pre-plant treatment. So in other words, what that means is that even though there was more alfalfa present in those plots with pre-plant control, there were also more weeds. And so kind of provides an opportunity to kind of clear out um, some of that weed pressure after first cutting. In terms of the yield results, the highest yielding were those that had the, the lowest weed pressure, um, but the ones that had only pre-plant control and no in-season control um, still did yield significantly higher than those with no control, um, although not nearly as high as those that had both. Um, and then the final data point that I collected was alfalfa plants per quadrant after first cutting. And so after the, the first cutting, I went back in and kind of evaluated the remaining alfalfa stand using a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter quadrant. Um, there were significant differences. Um, so if we're looking at the raptor in season with the pre-plant treatments and not the highest um, were kind of here where both happened. However, where there was no in-season control, the stand was still pretty good. And so, um, you know, with regards to the pre-print treatments, both glyphosate spray and tillage pre-plant did significantly increase alfalfa stand compared to the plots with no plant treatment. But when um, those that were kind of comparing these two numbers, actually there was no statistically significant difference. And so in other words, the Raptor in-season didn't seem to make a stronger stand when tillage was used pre-plant. So that kind of would, it, to me, says that the, the stand is going to kind of recover now that the, the weeds have, have been kind of chopped down, have, have, uh, have germinated, grown, and been chopped down. So in quick summary, pre-plant control is pretty essential for increasing yield and stand count. The highest yields were in plots with both pre-plant and in-season control. Um, the stand counts in plots with pre-plant control, but no in-season herbicide application were still relatively high. And so if in-season control is limited, either because uh, raptor spray, the cost of raptor spray, or because someone is in an organic production system or has some other limitation that does not allow for control in season, it may actually be possible to do a pre-plant tillage or pre-plant glyphosate spray to control those weeds, establish a good sand, kind of suffer through the first cutting where you have pretty heavy weed pressure, um, have a yield reduction for first cutting, but that the impact may not carry over into subsequent cuttings um, because the stand is still strong underneath the canopy. And in fact, in that plot where I showed the picture um, with the very tall weeds, there was still a lot of alfalfa to be seen in the understory, kind of just waiting to, to flourish. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna move on to a black eye variety trial that we're working on, uh, Rachel and I, with some breeders down at UC Riverside. Um, this is looking at basically two new experimental lines that they're breeding for um, resistance to fusarium wilt, nematodes, and aphids. And the aphid resistance seems to be conferring better ligus tolerance as well, although that's not what is necessarily being bred in. But we are looking at ligus sting as an indication of the bridal success. And so this picture on the left, these are single row plots. Um, CB5 is a commercial variety that's being used as a control. CB77 um, is actually this one that is starting to send us a little earlier. Then we have 74 and CB2 is on the far end next to that buffer. Uh, CB2 is a bit of an older variety that's being used as a control because it's very sensitive to a lot of pests. Um, here on the right side, we're looking actually at the CB... Um, 77 on the left and the CB72 on the right. And we can see quite a lot more aphids here in the CB2. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say that at the UCIPM guidelines line, there are black um, that are commercially available already. And it, there's a table that will indicate what the resistance is to fusarium and different nematode species. So if you have those pests in your field, please do consult that. Selecting um, resistant varieties is one of a, is a great way to reduce the need to control in season. Um, okay, so this is that again, CB77 and CB2 at harvest. And I just wanted to show this because it was really quite shocking when we went out to harvest, just the differentiation, the differentiation in number of aphids. Here we see this really, all the black here in this field are aphids. Um, and in CB77, we really saw no aphids. So it was pretty impressive to see this difference. Um, to show some of the yield data, um, this, this graph shows yields CB74 and 77 are the experimental lines on the right. They yielded um, higher than the CB2 or the CB5. Um, though when looking at seed size, 
Um, this, the size was smaller than the CB5. So CB5 is a popular variety. It has really nice, large seeds. Um, and it is um, a, great, a great commercial variety, though it does is susceptible to some of these pests. Um, the good news is that the breeders that we're working with at UC Riverside, because they know this is a popular variety, are actually working now to stack resistance to nematodes, fusarium, and aphids, um, which also will confer that ligus tolerance in CB5, so that is not available yet, but they are working to try to, um, to put these resistance genes that they have been able to breed into CB74 and 77 into the CB5 variety. So hopefully that will be commercially available in the summer of 2022. Um, so we're a couple years out. Um, and again, if you subscribe to our Bean blog, uh, you'll be able to keep updated on when that's happening. So. Um, the last kind of graph I wanted to show on this was the ligus stings, and we can see here on the right CB74 and CB77 did have the lowest number of ligus stings as compared to the CB2 are kind of susceptible to everything variety and CB5, which is a uh, um, commercially available variety already. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk quickly about some work that Rachel Long did with Dr. Ken Giles at UC Davis. They wanted to evaluate um, whether or not drones could be used to control the summer worm complex in alfalfa as compared to airplane applications. And um, please feel free to contact Rachel Long if you have any follow-up questions about um, this or any of the subsequent slides that I'll be presenting about her work. Um, her email, I realized I did not put on the slide, but it's rflong at ucanr.edu. And uh, you can also Google her and find her pretty easily. Um, and so this is one of the drones. You can see here the little tank at the bottom and the spray nozzles um, flying over the alfalfa field. This is the summer worm complex that they are, they're trying to control. So it's the Western yellow striped armyworm, the beet armyworm and the alfalfa caterpillar. And this is a picture of a field that has been infected. And what they did was they sprayed um, Prevathon insecticide in Yolo County, and they had the control, which is a no, no insecticide spray as compared to a drone or a more traditional aircraft application. Um, they found great news. The drone is as efficient as the airplane um, in terms of control. And the, the cool thing about drones is that they are becoming more and more available. So there is potentially an application if there is um, a bottleneck in terms of getting an airplane to come out or having access to a pilot who can fly. Um, for growers to kind of have that opportunity to do the spray themselves aerially using drones. Um, and that's why they wanted to evaluate this work just to even see if it, you know, how did it work? Um, at this point, you know, the drone technology is still kind of being evaluated and um, is, I would say, being developed and being uh, kind of advancing very rapidly. And so drone applications are a little more variable in terms of coverage. It's not necessarily due to the drone itself, but it's due to the technology of the nozzles. It was a little bit harder to get a really uniform application with some of the drone nozzles, but um, the anticipation is that that equipment will continue to um, be developed in a way to increase efficacy. Um, another challenge with the drones is that it can only carry 55 pounds total, including the drone unit, and the drone unit is about 10 pounds. Um, so you are limited in the area that you can uh, spray um, at this point. Um, but they, again, are developing drones that are a little bit bigger. So hopefully in the long run, um, that will be released that can carry more water units um, eventually. And this was only really evaluating one, um, one active ingredient for one pest complex, but um, some more work is kind of needed to evaluate others to make sure that it gets into the canopy adequately and in other cropping systems. Um, this, this is that Rachel did, these are preliminary results from 2020, although this is a repeat of some work that she did on the same kind of topic in 2012 and the results were the same. I did decide not to show that data because I, um, just in the interest of time, um, but she was looking at um, gibberellic acid, which is a plant growth regulator um, in black eyed peas to see um, if they would increase yields for the peas. And I would say basically it's too expensive for what happens on the left is the untreated, on the right is the treated. The plants do look bigger, they look great. Um, but in terms of the actual yield, there were no statistical significantly di differences. So on the left is, uh, in the left graph, the furthest left is this yellow bar, and that's um, yield in pounds per acre of the, the 
peas treated with the gibberellic acid and on the right are the untreated. It was a almost 14% difference in yield, but it was not statistically significant. And then if you kind of pencil out that dollars and cents, um, you know, you're spending $50 an acre to apply the treatment, but maybe making an extra $10 in terms of the yield difference. So it does end up actually being more expensive than, than it is worth at this point for field crops. Um, and then on the right side, this is seed weight in terms of grams per thousand seed. Um, and there were no differences in, in the individual seed weights. So, you know, potentially this would work in other cropping systems, but in field crops, it doesn't really seem to be super economical um, at this point. Um, the last topic I wanted to talk about is just give a quick pest management update in hemp. Um, this is an emerging field crop in our state, and I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who are working on this with me, Dan Putnam and Bob Hutmacher, who are um, corporate extension specialists for the state with statewide appointments. Um, we have observed agricultural pests in hemp um, that are pests in other cropping systems, um, but it's unconfirmed yet if they all cause significant loss or damage into hemp. And so it's really important that we spend more time with this crop to really know what uh, pests actually require treatment and require crop loss or crop significant crop damage and which are just present in the hemp field. Um, so here are some pictures of agricultural pests that have been observed, but we have not actually confirmed uh, crop loss. Webworms, and this is this picture here, it does seem like when they attack young plants, there may be a risk. It's unclear if the young plants are able to grow out of it or not. Um, and then this is leaf miner. So leaf miner can cause this visible damage in the leaves, but there's no evidence yet that it actually causes severe enough damage to affect crop yield. And so really that's kind of what we're looking for is like not necessarily even evidence, but evidence that there's um, a reduction in loss. Um, and I will say that it depends on what part of the hemp is uh, being harvested, but because most growers are growing it for CBD, they're harvesting the flower. Um, pests like this that are kind of attacking the leaves aren't necessarily going to affect the final quality of the harvested product. This last picture is actually spotted cucumber beetle, um, and then ligus mites were others that were observed, but um, it's not clear if they actually cause yield loss. So um, this, on the other hand, corn, or, corn earworm and tomato, tobacco budworm can cause severe flower damage. So this is the tobacco budworm. This is the larvae of the corn earworm. They're kind of nasty. They bite the cola off or the flower right before harvest and it causes this like necrotic area, which uh, makes it an unharvestable uh, product. And so this is so far, these two insect pests are the only ones that we can really confirm like do are very problematic for hemp production. Uh, moving briefly into diseases that have been observed in the state, this is um, botrytis blight. The symptoms are very similar to a uh, corn earworm damage and tobacco budworm damage. And actually when we first had that previous field, the um, somebody had told us that they, that they thought it was botrytis bite. And then when we opened it up, we found those little larvae in there. Um, and with botrytis, you would see the spores. Um, this in the middle is the beet curly top virus. And on the right is powdery mildew. Um, while beet curly top virus and botrytis appear to be problematic, um, the powdery mildew was observed, but the pressure was really mild and it actually didn't require treatment. So I've heard anecdotally a lot of people talk about powdery mildew, but I haven't actually heard of anyone talking about crop loss or crop reduction because of powdery mildew. So again, it's just really important with this new crop to not um, jump to control. Um, the control options are really limited anyway, but to not um, jump to control or jump to feel that there's an issue um, before we know if it actually is going to be affecting the final harvest. Um, as with all of us, it's really important to protect bees and other beneficials. Male hemp plants are very attractive to bees. On my website, you can find this one pager on uh, best practices for managing um, insects in hemp while protecting bees and other beneficials. Um, this is the picture of a dragonfly. There are a ton of beneficials in hemp fields. Um, and although most of the hemp plants grown are female, the males do make it in and they produce a ton of pollen and typically are, um, are, are flowering at the time in the season when the, the rest of the landscape is a little devoid of food. And so they can just be like these huge draws for these beneficials in the landscape. Um, and then there is a new resource, herbicide damage on hemp. Some work I worked on with Brad Hansen at UC Davis. You can see the symptoms at the herbicide symptomology website. This is a picture of glyphosate spray. 
and what that does to hemp. And just remember, always talk to your ag commissioner. Regulations are changing. Um, and what determines if a pesticide can be used on hemp is that it has to be exempt from residue tolerance requirements. It has to be exempt from registration and the use of the product would not be legally considered a use in conflict with the registered label. So there's a pretty narrow amount of products that can be sprayed at this point. And I highly advise um, always talking to your ag commissioner first to make sure that um, you are able to, um, you're applying appropriate spray. The last thing I wanted to mention before I wrap up is a pest alert for a new and very problematic weed that we're starting to see more and more of in our area. Um, it's Canada thistle. This is a perennial plant. It produces a very deep taproot and it can re-sprout and re-spread. Like many of our uh, perennial plants, um, if the, the part of the root or the, is getting moved around the field, it can it can come again. So it's very important um, to, to control this plant right away. This is a prohibited weed for seed production. So if you do any seed production um, or you have any neighboring fields that do seed production, there's a zero tolerance for this. Um, CCI, CCIA, the California Crop Improvement Association, who is charged with certifying seed fields has stated that they have a zero tolerance for um, the prohibitive weeds and that if they see the Canada thistle in any life stage, not even that it's flowering and producing seed, but in any life stage, that they will reject the lot. So it's, it's important um, to be able to identify it and then to control it. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the deep tap root, it is a little bit hard to sometimes pull it out of the field, although that really is the best opportunity to get all of that material out of the field. And once it is pulled up, Really, you got to get it get it out of there. Don't don't leave it in a way that it can get chopped up and resprout later. I'm um, just really physically remove it from the field. There isn't there isn't that much in our area yet. It's a kind of a new weed, so we just want to make sure that it doesn't spread. Um, and then the other important thing to remember about this weed is um, there really are few options for controlling Canada thistle in row crop ground. There are some. Um, herbicides that work in rangeland, but their plant back uh, is really long. And so there isn't, there aren't really very many good options in row crop ground. Roguing it really is great, pulling out the whole root. Um, a glyphosate spray in the fall when the Canada thistle is translocating the carbohydrates down to the root will be very effective. Um, one thing to remember with the herbicide application though is that you don't want to apply it at a really high rate and burn down. Um, the weed, because it'll just re-sprout from that taproot, you want to kind of apply it at a rate that will allow the, plot, the plant to really translocate that product down into the taproot and have it die a slow um, and painful death. And then that's a way to ensure good control. Along those lines as well, um, because it has to be translocated into the roots, it's really important that the herbicide spray is made when the plant is actively growing, when the Canada thistle is actively growing um, and actively transloading, translocating carbohydrates. Um, in other words, you're relying on the plant to kind of do the work of moving that, um, that active ingredient throughout its, um, its uh, roots and all of that. Um, applying it and applying glyphosate in the spring may be effective. I mean, you may have to do multiple years of treatment to eradicate a thick patch once it's established, but um, it's really important to, again, if you're doing any seed production, which we do a lot in our area, to just make sure that it's not spreading. Um, and I will just say this blog here down at the bottom, which is on the UC Weed Science blog um, on November 29th of this year, so just a few weeks ago, has a lot more details about um, this new weed. So thank you. Uh, with that, I will take any questions before break, and I may go in and launch my poll first. Okay, so the, the two questions that I have are both true-false. Um, one, pre-plant weed control is not important when establishing alfalfa stands because weeds can be controlled in season. And two, all known agricultural plant pests found in hemp should be controlled to avoid yield loss. Sarah, you have one question in the chat. Do you want to, uh, me to read it now or do you want to do the poll first, finish the poll first? Um, you, can, you can read it now. Okay, it's from Hannah. Do they know the mechanism for resistance conferring genes for aphids on soybeans? Is it molecular or do they change the morphology of the plant? 
Um, so just to clarify, we we're talking about black eyed peas in that presentation. Um, in terms of the mechanism for resistance, um, I do think that it is molecular, although I'm not a breeder, but I did not see, I don't believe that there are morphological changes that are preventing it to make it, you know, like less hospitable to the aphid or anything like that. I think it's um, something molecular, but I can confirm that with the breeder. Mm -hmm. If you have any other questions, please post them in the chat for Sarah. I'll just do like one more minute with the thing. Oh, actually we have 85% already voted. So we'll wrap it up now. Um, so the first question, pre-plant weed control is not important when establishing alfalfa stands because weeds can just be controlled in season. Um, this is false. It is really important to control weeds pre-plant um, to enable the alfalfa stand to be able to develop. Um, question number two, all known agricultural pests found in hemp should be controlled to avoid yield loss. Um, this is also false. Um, there are many known agricultural plant pests that are found in California that we do not know if they are actual true pests of hemp or if they are just present in the hemp field. And so really it is not necessary to spray or try to control all agricultural, known agricultural pests in hemp, that is false. Uh, thank you so much. With that, we have our um, next break. Our last talk resumes at 1025 and um, we will see you then. Thank you. <laughs>